We're starting a brand new series. Jesus Christ evaluates his churches. And in this series, it's kind of a dovetail to what we've been looking at before, which was the victorious and glorious church. Those six snapshots of what God looks at the church and says, hey, this is what the church is. And symbolically, this is what these pictures, these symbolic pictures that we looked at are from the the fence that had the gates with the keys and the, the chain on it and the victorious rescue to the bride, to the spiritual temple, to uh, the royal priesthood. And then we saw the people of God, the household of God. So we looked at those as pictures, what God looks at and what his end vision is for the church. So what we're looked at is from God's perspective, what does he look at as the church, the body of Christ from the biblical perspective? What does he look at? In spite of how the church really is. Okay. Understand that. He's looking. It's kind of like you ever had somebody say, well, you're looking through rosy colored glasses. Or you're putting on rosy colored, you know, glasses. And you're seeing the world shaded through that. And you've got this uh, crazy optimistic thing. I remember when I was a little kid, we had those uh, kaleidoscopes. And you'd look through it and you could change it and it would just, all these little crystals would reflect different things and it's kind of pretty to your eyes you know it's kind of like eye candy but it's not real whereas God looks at the church and it's real in the sense the end vision will happen and that's what he's looking at in our lives personally but he never looks at us personally divorced from the church we are a part of the church we are an us and a we ends. we all okay in this, in this series, we're going to look at the seven churches in the book of Revelation from various perspectives. We're going to look at it from Christ evaluating the church. If you look on the screen, you'll see that it is very symbolic. You'll see the seven, seven uh, lamps or the, the menorah. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about uh, the lion and the lamb eventually in the book of Revelation. But in this vision that John has, he sees Jesus revealed. But it's not just Jesus revealing himself. It's Jesus revealing the future. It's from Jesus. It's about Jesus, but it's also about what's going to happen. In this, we're going to look at, and on your paperwork, if you want to write this down, we're going to look at the likes and the dislikes of Jesus and the things that Jesus hates and the things that Jesus loves. So I'll repeat that. The likes and dislikes of Jesus, the things that Jesus hates, and the things that Jesus loves. We want that perspective. We want to know what he likes. We want to know what Jesus wants, what he looks for in the church, how he evaluates the churches, and what that is reflective of how we should be as a church. That is, avoid those things that he dislikes, avoid those things that he hates, and really gravitate toward those things that he loves and really likes. We are looking at those seven churches in that way. So we're going to look at the very first chapter, and it's on your page there, on the sheet that you have. I'm using the New King James Version. It's uh, it's beyond inspired, I guess, because a lot of people think, you know, the King James is the authorized the only authorized. But uh, I like it. It flows well. So let's look at Revelation chapter 1. And you know I'm being facetious about the King James stuff. It's just a translation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation is from where we get the apocalypse from. Apocalypsos. It has to do with revealing, unveiling. It's kind of like the Wizard of Oz. I mean, from our own perspective. That wizard, the great and mighty wizard, you know, in that movie, and then you find out he's a little guy that's just nothing, and he was you're looking through a magnifying glass and all the projection. And behind the curtain was this, well, in this case, in the revelation of Jesus, we're going to see the revealing of Jesus, but not also, it's also 
the revealing of what Jesus is revealing to John. Does that make sense? So it's a both and. So you're also going to write down these two words, both, B-O-T-H, and then the word and. We're going to see a both and in everything, in a lot of things, not everything, but a lot of things. That is, dual application, fulfillment that is incurred for those nowadays, but also for the future. What can we draw from looking through these seven churches, Christ's evaluation, and the Revelation, even in chapter 1? What can we look to and draw from and glean from? Things that apply to us. Now, again, I will, I will caution us to try to take this personally. Do not take it as personal. Take it always as us-ins, we-ins. It's always about the church, the body of Christ. But in this case, instead of the global church, it's focused on the local church, the local church family. What can we learn about what Christ is talking about for the local church family. So the first three chapters of Revelation relate to the local church, both application-oriented but also prophetically. How many of you know that when you approach the book of Revelation, it is a prophetic book? It is a prophetic book. I mean, most people skip over the first three chapters and go right on to the tribulation stuff or, you know, all of the things that are going on in the tribulation, chapter 4 onward. But there's this part that people who skip over this kind of just skip over and don't pay attention to. And it has everything to do with the church today, but also through the ages. It has everything to do with what does God want in his church. And that's why it's so important. So when we looked at those snapshots of what God looked at as pictures symbolically of what the church is, these picture snapshots... Now we're going to get a little more granular. We're going to get more, what does he want? What is he looking for? And, and from that, we can say, well, this is the kind of church we want to plant. This is the kind of church we want to grow because it's, it coincides with the heart of Christ. It coincides with the head who is Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Things which must shortly or quickly Take place, meaning that once they start unfolding, they're going to happen very quickly. It didn't mean that shortly in the sense of while John was writing this. I want also for you to think of this is in relationship to time relating to the writer. So, Josh, if you are writing something today about your history, about your brothers or things like that, and you somehow have a vision of the future, but it's for 10 years from now. If you're writing something like that, you're writing it, it's from your perspective at your point in time while you're writing it. Let's say 20 years pass and you're 30 years old or something and you look back, what you were looking at 10 years from when you were right now is going to be in your past. That is, you're going to be 30 years old looking back at something that happened 10 years from when you wrote something. And that's what we're talking about here. You have to remember who's writing, what time period was he writing about, I mean at, like when was he penning this? So it's around 100 A.D. or 95 A.D., somewhere in there. So he's writing this. And so it's from the, the point of time that he's actually penning this while he's on the island of Patmos. So think this through. So things which must shortly or quickly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel, to his servant John. And this John is James and John, the two brothers of the family of Zebedee, you know, the fishing partners of Andrew and Peter. This is probably the youngest disciple. He outlives everybody. In fact, in fact, everybody else about killed by this time, by the time he's writing this. And somehow he survived uh, all kinds of torture, all kinds of persecution. And they didn't know what to do. with. They were scared of him because everything they tried to do wouldn't kill him. Literally, this is what the tradition is, at least the history. And so they had to put him out on this prison island because we just don't know what to do with this guy. Now, why is he here? We're going we're gonna to find out why he's here. Look at verse 2. It says, who bore witness to the word of God. That is the servant, that is John. John, why is he here on the island of Patmos? Why is he writing this? 
He bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. That means that when you are preaching and teaching the word of God, when you are living according to the word of God and bearing witness to Jesus Christ to people around you, even back then, they didn't like it. It was an affront to their sinful nature. And they did not like it. It was countercultural. They, they weren't these disciples were not trying to fit in. They were seeking to only please Jesus. And that's what it says here. He is that his whole life is right now, John, is about the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is the word of God, the Bible, and the gospel. The gospel message of Christ. And they, what did they do? They put him on an island. Look at verse 3. This is a promise to us when we read the book of Revelation. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. Oh, yes. It's a prophetic book. That's what it says. You see, if you spend enough time in the Bible, Bible interprets Bible. The word of God, it's like, well, I don't understand what this means. Well, we'll go back and you'll find out. There's probably 95% of what you can find out in the Bible that will help solve the issue of what you're not understanding. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. For the time is near. Keep, that means to obey. That means there's principles in here. Principles that we should obey. There are commands or principles, precepts, patterns we're looking at Something of, we need to pay attention. He's saying, you need to pay attention and you're going to be blessed. You're going to be happy. There's going to be a flow of blessing from God in your life. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, Asia Minor is modern day Turkey. Not the Turkey you eat, but the country Turkey. There's a country named Turkey. And that's that's where he's talking about. All these seven churches are there. That is, the remnants are still there today. Grace to you and peace From him who is, who was, and who is to come. It's another way of saying the eternal one, the one who always was, who always is, who is to come. From the seven spirits who are before his throne. That's going to be interesting to look at. But suffice it to say, they're not seven holy spirits. It's sevenfold spirit of God. Before the throne of God. Or it could be seven angels, depending on how you look at it. But there's only one Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, ruler over the kings of the earth. Oh, but the kings of the earth have said, you can't preach the gospel in our country. Who's the ruler over the kings of the earth? When he said, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given unto me. Go, therefore, and make disciples among all nations. So, who's the ruler over the kings of the earth? Jesus Christ. You're going to see a continuous little revealing of who Jesus is in this passage. That's why Jesus has to be the center of our life. You can talk about all the mechanics of church all you want, but unless Jesus is at the center, and unless Jesus is the center of the life of the people, but also the life of the church and the head of that church family. Unless he is the one we live for and he is the one that we obey and follow as shepherd and head, it makes no sense. Continue on on with verse 5. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests or royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. We talked about that, that spiritual royal priesthood, that snapshot. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It opens with worship. This chapter opens up with the revealing of Jesus and we need to worship him. It opens up with worship. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. That's taken from Zechariah Chapter 12. If you want to put a little note there, verse 7 relates to Zechariah chapter 12. Verse 8 I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. 
It reminds me of the great I am of Exodus chapter 3, 13 through 16. The great I am. I am who I am. Always was, always will be. When you think of the very covenant name of God in the Old Testament, Yahweh, Yehovah, Yahweh, however you would pronounce that, it means the one who is. It is a label of a de- with definition. When we are speaking toward him, when he is speaking to us, revealing himself, he says, I am. I am. And, and, it, and it has this connotation or this, this sense of I always was, I always am, and always will be. And that's what's captured in this right here. But he also says the Almighty, which references to El Shaddai, which was also given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is, the name was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of who God is. So you have basically the Old Testament revelation of who Yahweh God is in this chapter or in this verse. Verse 9. Now, this is going to be interesting. Listen to what John says. He's going to give a testimony of his encounter. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Not the great tribulation, but the tribulation that he was going through at that point. Was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Like I said, he was in prison because of being obedient to God. He was proclaiming the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Paul says, if we want to live godly, we will be persecuted. If we all who live godly will have some sort of persecution. If you don't have any persecution, find out what you're not doing for Jesus. I always say that. If people aren't against you, then you ought to get out there and proclaim the word of God. Be obedient to the word of God and proclaim it. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Most would interpret that the first day of the week. That's when the Lord was resurrected from the dead. Most people would say that that's what that is. First century has a lot of tradition that is writings about the Lord's Day, meaning like what we would call Sunday today. They didn't really call it Sunday back then, but first day of the week, the Lord's Day. And heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book. Send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. That's not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, by the way. Again, we're talking Turkey. Then I turn to see the voice. Now just stop for a minute. How do you see a voice? Aha. In Genesis 3... King James actually translates this correctly. After Adam and Eve sinned, it said they heard the voice of the Lord, or the, ver- the voice of Yahweh God walking in the cool of the evening, walking in the forest or walking in the garden. Okay, Heard a voice walking. When do you hear a voice walking? Voice of the Lord. Now, in most understandings, even in Talmud and other places, when they looked at this, they were thinking that God is saying, and he did say, Adam, where are you? Okay. But he was continually saying this, but it was angry voice, like a thunder, because who told you you were naked? What have you done? It wasn't gentle. This was judgment he was coming in. Like a torrent. Scary, huh? But what it echoes at, it was something on a regular basis that they would normally have met with him on a normal basis. There's a connotation. There's a hint here that they met daily with him or met on some occasion with him. So when they listened, they heard the voice of the Lord walking. Now here in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, it says he turned around to see the voice. A voice conveys words, thoughts, or ideas of a mind through communication. In the old days, they would call that logos. In the Greek, they would call it logos, which is the same thing as 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1, 1, 1, the Logos. The voice of God incarnate is Jesus Christ. Do you see that glory of God incarnate is Jesus Christ? We see in here the voice of, of God. So we see the voice of God as Jesus incarnate. Does that make sense? The voice of God, the one who communicates who God is, the very voice of God is Jesus. The word of God is Jesus. So I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. And his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flame of fire. Can you imagine seeing this? And his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, so shiny, shiny brass. And his voice as the sound of many waters, torrents, like waterfalls and waves, you know, the crashing waves. It's like, that's what he's talking about, not many waters, like a bunch of ponds that are quiet. This is noisy, boisterous, powerful, thundering. He had in his right hand seven stars. Now, here's this vision of this flaming eyes, brilliant, bright, shiny, glowing Jesus. He's no longer this this meek and mild Messiah in Nazareth. But he is this one who is grand and glorious and powerful. The vision of the Messiah being revealed. So he has seven stars in his right hand. Out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. I mean, how many of you ever kind of glance at the sun and you can barely look? And that's what he's seeing. Jesus in this glorified and it's symbolic view. Understand, this is a symbolic viewing of Jesus. This is not probably how Jesus really even looks. This is a manifestation of a symbolic view. That's why I didn't show that. They have a lot of different pictures. And you look at it and say, oh, that's what Jesus looks like. No, we're looking at symbolically these pictures that convey concepts and ideas of the power and the glory of Jesus Christ. Two-edged sword, sharp two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. We know later on that's going to destroy the Antichrist and his armies. And we're a part of that. But it's the word of God. It means the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. That's what he's talking about. It's the word of God coming out of his mouth. And when I saw him, as we would do, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand. See, now he's going to interpret. And the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So the seven churches which he enumerated earlier are symbolized in this symbolic view of the menorah. And let me say, everything we're going to see for this book is Israeli Hebraic imagery based. It's all flashbacks back to the Old Testament. But it's about the church in the first three chapters. But he's looking at Old Testament imagery. Israeli Hebraic imagery. You can't get away from our roots of who we are in Christ or the Messiah. So, angels. Let me quickly talk about this. Later on, he's going to give messages to these angels who will give it to the churches. The word can be translated as messenger. Okay, so there's angelic beings, but they're messengers of God who bring messages. Okay, Then there is the angel of God, who is the word of God, who is the voice of God in the Old Testament, who is now Jesus Christ. 
the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. So we have this view of who Jesus is in the Old Testament, but the angels for these churches are probably the pastors, probably the lead elder of each one of these churches, who is the messenger of the word of God. Because why would God have to give this scroll to them or give these different things to them? So this is more likely that these are uh, the, the leaders of each church that are that way. Now, people say, well, then that means every church has an angel from God. I'm not sure how that would work. You, you actually have some problems. So the best interpretation would be that this is to the leadership of each one of these churches because John himself is going to take these scrolls. He's going to have the book of Revelation, and he's going to have seven copies, or probably eight, one to keep for himself. And he has seven of them, and he hand delivers them to these angels. So you know it's not an angelic being, it's an earthly human being. He actually hands it to them. So he's, he's commissioning John to give write this in a book and then give it to these guys, give it to a person. So it makes sense that these are human beings that he's giving to. So a messenger can flip-flop in that sense. So you have to look at the context and understand what's going on here. It's good to understand because then it opens up. It's like a key that opens up the lock for passages. It helps you understand that there are angelic beings who stand before God. And so in those cases, the ones that blow the trumpets, the ones who are flying in midair, you know, those are what we would call angelic beings some sort of supernatural beings that are on God's side, at least. And then you have fallen ones that are on Satan's side. Satan and his angels, Revelation 12, Michael, the archangel, and his angels. Well, those aren't humans they, because they're flying in mid-heaven and they're battling in the heavenlies. So context helps. These are tools for you to understand what's going on. This message now that Jesus brings is all about this, the seven lampstands. For the next two chapters relates to the seven churches. It's interesting to note that he looks at each church as a light. Not each person, but each church. And he's looking at each local church family. Each local church family is distinctive. Does that make sense? They're distinctive. It doesn't mean when I say the church, which one? Are you talking about the global church of God or local churches? Plural. Because local churches are where we are a part of. That's what we gather together in. We don't gather in the global church. The global church consists of the local churches. Similar to my body, is consisted of cells. Each one of those cells is like a church, let's say, in the body of Christ worldwide. But the local body is the local church. And that's what we're looking at here. And, and he makes it very clear in this passage that's what he's talking about. So let's go over some of these points that are brought up in this passage. When it talks about I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end, talks about Alpha and Omega in those verses that we just read. They're referencing something about God in the Old Testament. And this is where John is being, it's being revealed to him. He already knows this because he already wrote the Gospel of John, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John. He's already written those. So he already knows the deity of Christ. He understands the concept and the idea of the deity of Christ. But God knocks it out of the park in this chapter because of this verse in Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, that's Yahweh God, the King of Israel. Notice the tying back to Israel. And his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth. I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. And in this passage, in verses 11 and 17 of Revelation 1, Revelation 1, verses 11 and 17, it ties Jesus and equates Jesus as the God of Israel. 
This is very significant. You can't really understand the rest of the book of Revelation unless you catch this. Another one is when it says that it's revealed like the Son of Man. When, when John is looking at him and he sees him as the Son of Man, John is looking at through the ages back into Daniel chapter 7 and seeing the vision that Daniel saw. So the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Isaiah are very much tied into the book of Revelation. And what John is seeing, John is seeing this awesome vision of, of verses 9 through 10 and 13 through 14 of Daniel 7. Of the Ancient of Days coming and having court. And this is in the end of times. And this one who comes on clouds of glory. One who is the Son of Man. Like unto a Son of Man. Who is given a kingdom which shall never end. Now only God has a kingdom that never ends. Only God has an eternal kingdom. And so whoever this Son of Man is. Something's wrong. Unless he's God. Unless he's God, there's no way he can rule over the kingdom of God. Only God rules over the kingdom of God. So John is seeing this vision of the Son of Man. So anytime in the New Testament where Jesus refers to himself in the Gospels as the Son of Man, he's referring to the most deified divine vision of the Messiah that there is in the Old Testament. Son of Man, many times we think of as the human side of Jesus. But no, this is the divine Son of Man. Son of God is similar to like Adam was the Son of God in the sense of creation. That refers to the humanity side of God or Jesus. The humanity side of Jesus. The earthly side through Mary. Interesting, huh? That the Son of God, you would think, relates to deity. But... It relates to deity in human, but in the human incarnate. But the Son of Man relates to the divine. So much so you can't see the human part of it. That's what it is. Well, that's what John saw. When John saw this glorious vision of who Jesus is, he, he fell on his face. You remember how Daniel did in the Old Testament. Every time those angels revealed themselves... And then eventually there was one vision where he's by a river and there's this one who reveals himself is never named as an angel. And he's above these messengers. And he, he fits exactly the same description as what John is seeing. So this vision that Daniel saw is like what John is seeing or what John sees is like what Daniel sees. Glorious vision. So in chapter 1, we see this revelation of Jesus Christ. So now, as we go into chapters 2 and 3, it's good to note this. Jesus has the right to evaluate every local church family on planet Earth. He has the right to do it because he's the head of the church. It's been given unto him. Ephesians chapter 1, 22 through 23 says, And God put all things under his feet, under Jesus' feet, and gave him to be head over all things pertaining to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That is, Jesus is expressed in who he is through the body of Christ. He is the head. Colossians 1.18 And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. That reference is back to the first and last, the one who was dead but is alive forevermore in Revelation 1. You see how this, this theme is consistent throughout the New Testament. You can't make this up to be this consistent. Jesus wants all his disciples to be blessed. Remember we opened up in verse 3. If you read this and keep it, if you read this, there's a condition. Not everything that God does is just lavished on you and you don't have to do anything. You're not like a mushroom that just absorbs things. You're actively engaged, involved, cooperating. The life of the Christian is involvement and engagement with Christ in obedience. 
So we are blessed and we get the best of Christ if we fulfill those conditions. What are the things? So what we're looking at then is we're going through chapters 1, 2, and 3. What are we looking at that would be something that is something that we are to obey from God? we got to keep our eyes peeled. What is it that we, we should keep our eyes peeled to look out for? Oh, this is something that God wants us to obey. If we obey it, we are blessed. That's what he says in verse 3. <clears throat> the titles, the word pictures, and job description of Jesus in chapter 1 should lead us to worship him. What did it do to John? It was so overwhelming that caused him to faint. But it was he was worshiping God. He was worshiping Jesus. It wasn't that he was just shocked. It was worshipful, overwhelming power encounter of Jesus Christ. When he got the picture of who Jesus is, at least that picture, that vision, it caused him, it humbled him, and dropped him to his knees. And in this case, of course, he fainted. He was overwhelmed. He was like a dead man. But here, what we learn from this is we should be overwhelmed with Jesus. Jesus, in our quiet time with him, in our time of worship together, when we assemble, when we are focused on Jesus, it should cause our heart to leap. It should cause us to bow down. It should cause us to want to know him more, like we, we sang today. We long for him. We're desperate for him. We hunger for him. But it also should overwhelm us to the point where, where it causes us to bow down to him that he is Lord, that he is God. So how we envision Jesus, that's the degree of what or how we worship him. Do you hear this? So the, to the degree of how we envision who he is, not some picture that reminds us of some picture on the wall at church or something, you know, some, some artist rendition, but the picture biblically the symbolic imagery of who Jesus is, that vision should drive us to worship. And now, this is a key to unlock things. This is not trivia. This is like giving you a toolkit. Number four is the overall plan of the book of Revelation is explained. Jesus explains it to us. Jesus gives us Keys to unlock the book of Revelation. At least an overview. It's in three parts. So what John had seen up to that point, that it would be John's recent past. What he's seen since the day of Pentecost until when John is penning this. Basically, the beginning of the church movement in Christ. What you have seen. The things which are, that's the church age. And that would be chapters 2 and 3. Things which are. Because in ver, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, after this. Well, in chapter 1, verse 19, it says, after this. So you link up this after this, and you know that it has to do with chapter 4 onward. So when you read verses 19 and 20 again in chapter 1, look at this. Write down the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The this is chapters 2 and 3, the church age. Because the after this occurs again, that actual phrase occurs in chapter 4. That's the after this. He's kind of keying you. Hey, remember that when I said after this? I'm saying after this. That means before the after this is chapters 3 and 2. I mean, it's just grammatical, and it helps you understand. He's giving you a hint here. He's giving you keys to unlock this. So the church age is going to be talked about in chapter 2 and 3. And chapter 4 is the, the transition into the tribulation Chapter 4 is the rapture of the church because the church is no longer seen on earth after that 
from that point forward are believers. So he gives you a hint here of an overview of what's going on. Chapter 4 onward is after this. So that means the this is the church age. Up to that point is what John's history is up to that point. The first 60 years or so of church history. Amazing, huh? So all of that's there. You see, as we read through scripture, we've got to go deep and listen and reread it and go over it. It's like, what is he talking about here? Ask questions. And when you see what what God is saying, write it down and go over it and make sure it fits with the rest of scripture. Because if it doesn't fit, it's probably not right. Your ideas. Bounce it off with other people. Pray about it. Seek God's face. Because within the body of Christ, that God reveals his word. Isn't that amazing? So when we look at what God is going to do in chapter 1, chapter 1 opens up the doors as an outline for the rest of the book. And it's very apropos that they just put it as chapter 1. Whoever divided that up did it very well. Because chapters 2 and 3 could have just been one chapter. Or each one of those churches could have been a chapter of its own, however you did it. But it's amazing. I'm amazed how God has done this. So in the, in the next weeks that come, we're going to go back and forth. We're going to look at all of the concepts and ideas that he's revealing here. Go back into maybe Ephesians. Go back into Colossians. When a certain concept is talked about, we're going to go back. We're going to look at things in the Old Testament about Elijah and uh, Jezebel. And we're going to look maybe at Balaam. Anytime something's mentioned... We're going to go back into history, kind of look at the concepts and ideas in Scripture, and then go through so we can learn and understand, why is he referencing this? There are references to something that relates to something that will help us grow in Christ, help us be a better church family. Amen? Isn't that great? It's exciting. I'm excited to see what God is going to reveal in his word.